It's Stan in Gainesville. It's Saturday morning, my friend. And you, all of you, are listening to Light Talk. And this is Ellen, coming to you from the beautiful island of St. Bart's. And you are listening to Light Talk. And this is David, coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know... We knew, we knew, we knew. You are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. And sister. There you go. You better believe that, Ellen. Welcome, everyone, to episode 331. And today, you have Stan, Ellen, and me, plus, just like last week, we are honored to have one of our listeners here to ask his question live. Ladies and gents, may I introduce to you Mr. Jack Justice. Hey, Jack, Woo-hoo. welcome to the Insanity of Light Talk. Thank you. Jack, it's so good to have you. Can I just interject one thing, David? Yes, please we, do. When we, when we started this thing of trying to get people to come on, we had concluded that it didn't work. That's right. No, Nobody was coming. Everybody was scared. We were trying to motivate people and nobody was showing up. And now all of a sudden... It's like a new product. We launched a new product and it sort of failed, like new Coke. New Coke. <laughs> new <laughs> and, light talk. And now we're, we're, it's kind of taken off. We, we're booked up with guests to ask questions for the next two shows, I think. I know. And we had one last week and one two weeks yeah. before that. It's like crazy. Maybe it wasn't such a bad idea. No, it wasn't. Just our timing was a bit off. But anyway, let's get back to Jack. Jack, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, man? Where are you from, first of all? So I am a high school student in Orange County going to um, St. Margaret's Episcopal School. Mm -hmm. I have been doing lighting design throughout my high school career, and I'm just starting to branch out and trying to get more involved. Um, But I am planning to study engineering in college. Uh, Nice. Smart Smart kid. (laughs) Smart man. (laughs) Very smart. Engineering. Well, that's great, man. And how long have you been listening to this crazy show? Oh, too long. Um, <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I think for about a year now, okay. I think I've gotten through about 100 episodes. All right. Wow. So. Wow. wow. Your brain must be hurting. That, I'm, I'm, I must tell you, Jack, that's not the record because the young lady who was with us last week has been through all of our episodes twice. Oh, that's so she's crazy. listened to 600 episodes of this stupid show. <laughs> Jackie, she was awesome. Yeah. So, you know, you, it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, Jack, do you know where you want to go to school? Are you thinking about that yet? Um, I have a couple schools that I'm looking at, but my number one is University of Chicago right now. Ah, uh-huh. I love Chicago. Uh-huh. Great, great Although, choice. Although, if I were to go there, I'd be studying computer science because they don't have yeah. an engineering program. But let me tell you something. After you hear our sponsor today, you're going to probably want to stick with computer science. <laughs> <laughs> But we'll talk about more of that later when we talk about AI. So listen, Jack, it's great to have you with us. But before we get started with Jack's question, let's talk about news today. Light Talk News. (laughs) Topping today's news is the amazing LDI trading lineup just announced today from Live Design Online. And who better to talk about this than our sister Ellen, who has has an intimate relationship with LDI. (laughs) So Ellen, tell us a little bit about it. Because I'm impressed, personally. About LDI or about the training program? About the training. Oh, I'm always impressed by LDI, but the training this year looks awesome. Okay. Well, I will say, in all honesty, that this is our largest training program ever. Um, We were always limited in the past because of this, that, or the other thing. And this year, our show director, uh, Jesse Chybulski, decided that, well, what the hell, let's just expand stuff a little bit. So the LD Institute, which is the pre-show a lot of hands-on lighting console training, um, a lot of software uh, training, even an AI uh, generative um, design tools, half-day session, um, all kinds of interesting stuff, Ethernet, project management, um, how to use Smartsheet, you know, all kinds of everything you can imagine is in there. And we went from, uh, I think, 50 sessions to 68 this year. Wow, that's awesome. Which is a, a big jump. Um, because a lot of those smaller hands-on lighting console classes sort of sell out right away and the Vectorworks classes sell out pretty quickly. So we wanted to have more options uh, for people to sort of front load the week. Um, Also, LDI is in December for the first time this year, which meant that some people who normally were opening shows right around the Thanksgiving, everything is open by then, um, pretty much, except David. Um, (laughs) That's true. (laughs) And... that some designers that normally can't come are able to come, which is great. 
And we decided this year with X Live, um, with our creative consultant for that, Bob Boniol, that the focus for um, the X Live sessions this year is AI, XR, and immersive environments. So there's a lot of that. There's some virtual production. There's uh, keynotes from uh, Meow Wolf, Disney, and Moment Factory. Um, there's a huge, wide, diverse range of speakers. If you take a look at the website, www.ldishow.com, you can see um, there's a huge, huge list of like well over 120 speakers so far, and they're still coming in. A lot of sessions just have moderators yet. So it will be really robust. It's an incredible professional training opportunity. So Jack, are you going to LDI this year? I am not. Um <laughs> You're coming we'll now, okay? You got to be there. <laughs> we're doing our show. I believe, you know, we were talking about, Ellen and I off camera, <laughs> we're talking about this on what? About maybe doing it on Sunday this year. Uh, because it's a weird thing this year because it's starting a little later. Right, Ellen? It starts like on Wednesday? Yes, it's not only in December, but the show, no, the show runs Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. The um, Institute courses start, I think it's Wednesday. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or even some maybe on Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then the show floor is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Yeah, that's that's a little different. So we're all trying to wrap our heads I around know. that one. And Brackley and Zach should be around too. So yeah, that's that'll be great. Also in the news, and this is really big news. Starting August first, which was four days ago, most incandescent light bulbs are now banned for sale in the U.S. So what are they doing with them? <laughs> well, first there are exceptions. Okay, I'm going to give you a list of about eight, nine exceptions here. Any appliance lamps, including refrigerator and oven lights, black lights, thank God black lights are, are not banned, bug lights, colored lights, colored lamps, infrared lamps, left-handed thread lamps. Now, that's the great thing. All you need is a bunch of left-handed thread uh, sockets, and you're fine. Plant lights, floodlights, reflector lamps, so I guess ours are still available, maybe even PARs. Showcase lamps, traffic signals, always good to have traffic signals, and some other specialty lights, including marine lamps and some odd-sized bulbs. And guess what? Soon to come, next year, the end of 2024, no more compact fluorescent lamps. They will be banned as yay. well. Yay! I know. <laughs> so that we say yay to. Not the incandescents, no but the compact fluorescents. No tears shed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. I don't know why they ever existed in the first place, you know. Yeah, that's true. They, they, well, they exi existed because of the oil embargo. Yeah. Oh. That's interesting. But, you know, do you remember Howard Branson, who was an um, architectural lighting yeah. designer? One time he gave a very interesting speech about office lighting. And he said that if you are in an office without a window, change jobs. <laughs> and secondly, if the only light in the wintertime after the sun goes down is fluorescent, change jobs. And he said, if you sit in an office where there's only fluorescent lighting, by three o'clock in the afternoon, you're incapable of doing anything. That's right. It actually just makes you insane. Right. I, I never turn on my fluorescent lights in my office. I just turn on my, I, I actually have incandescent lights in my office and they will stay right. that way. I have plenty of incandescent lights last the right. rest of my life. Okay. So that's the news and uh, let's get started. And guess what? Jack, you came all the way from Orange County, California to Orange County, California, <laughs> to ask this question. Why don't you give us your question and we'll do the best to answer it. You mean he didn't leave the comfort of his own home? No. Yeah, like Jackie didn't leave the comfort of her own, own home either because we're doing right. this magical, you know, Zoom magic. All right. Teleporting. All right, Jack. Okay. Jack. So <laughs> um, I'm planning to study either like engineering or computer science in college, but I want to continue doing lighting design. And I was wondering if there were any design opportunities for people who aren't in a lighting or design major. You mean like taking a lighting class uh, and even though you're not a major? Because most yeah. schools will allow you to do that. You can take lighting as, a, uh, as an elective. Either taking a lighting class or actually designing or oh, yeah. like assisting on a show. Where I work, we have a long history of that. Um, in fact, I've had electrical engineers, majors, they, they sign up for electrical engineering because their parents want them to, or they think whatever it is, they take one lighting course. We have a whole bunch of opportunities and they go, wow, I really like this. And oftentimes we work it out so they can double major. And what a powerful, powerful um, thing to have under your belt. 
a, degree, a major in engineering and lighting design, you will never want for work. So I would seek a program that would, an institution that would allow you to double major. Hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, the other thing is like um, at big places like, you know, Cirque du Soleil and um, uh, uh, major theaters, they need an IT person as well as uh, the lighting designer. So you could always sort of do like a combination job. I mean, can you imagine a master electrician who actually knows everything there is to know about IT and can fix and run everything? Ellen, you know Robert Bell, right? Yes. He's a name that comes to mind of someone who wrote code, understood computers, loved the entertainment industry. So there's a lot of crossover there, Jack. And I think I've got three students who just graduated who are all working in engineering firms with mm. light, that have lighting design divisions. Yep. So it's not a problem. And um, absolutely. And I think it's actually really wise of you to do that. Well, first, I'm going to second everything that Ellen and Stan said. Uh, and engineering is going to be one of the, in my opinion, again, Stan's right. We don't know what's going to happen. But I think engineering is going to be a profession that lasts for a while. Uh, I think if you, you know, I think that if you're able to do the work uh, outside of your engineering major to be a lighting designer, uh, then that's great. And I know that a lot of programs will welcome you. A lot of theater programs will say, oh my God, someone wants to be a lighting designer? Great. But the problem is, is that you're going to have to find time to focus. You have to find time to tech it. You know, and that may, especially in your first few years of uh, school, that may be a lot. So you want to make sure that it doesn't like uh, affect your grades and affect what, you know, what you're doing. So yeah. uh, that's my only caution to it. But I think you should do as much as you want to do. I mean, I think all three of us agree that being an undergraduate, especially in a liberal arts type of um, university, you want to try as many things as possible. And that's where you really find what your love is, I believe. So yeah. I have another thought on that, too, mm -hmm. which is that Jack has already found one of the solutions that a lot of people do, uh, which is to work at their church. Right. Um, a lot of people who are other things, even doctors, lawyers, all kinds of things that have a love for lighting, uh, volunteer mm -hmm. um, and give their time and uh, do some divine lighting on the weekends. Oh, I like divine lighting. That Ooh. would be a great business name, divine lighting. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> there you go, Jack. Awesome. <laughs> so Jack said that he's already doing that at, uh, what do you say, Saddleback, Saddleback Church? Yeah. Saddleback mm -hmm. Valley Community Church. Yep. Well, there you go. So that's another thing that some people do. If your engineering or uh, computer job becomes too intense that you don't have time to actually design tech and run a lighting show, um, you could always continue in the church market, which is huge. And some of those churches, I don't know if you've been to like Crystal Cathedral up the road there, but man, do they have a huge system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's reassuring to hear. Then Stan has the next question. I have something from Ariel from New London, Connecticut. And she says, what actually happens when we power cycle an electronic device? Like, what are the mechanics of that? Like, what's really going on in there? And I'm going to make a joke first, and then I'm going to give a serious answer. You know, we all have to sleep. And sometimes when we sleep, actually, I think this is true, we get brainwashed. Like all the events of the day, the brain just cleans itself out of everything that happened that day. And you wake up, some people do anyway, you wake up fresh with clean with a new brain. So that's sort of what it does. And I was dealing with that this week, but I have a little bit of... In new insight to it. So I asked AI to help me with the answer to this question. And she gave me six answers or six reasons why you would do it. The first one is to refresh the memory because power cycling cleans, clears the device's memory, including the RAM. Okay, this helps us oh, and so on. Any processes that were tied up that were still going on get released. Software reset. Sometimes electronic devices can encounter software glitches, temporary errors. Power cycling allows the device software to start fresh, potentially resolving these issues. Hardware reset, network connectivity, and firmware updates, and energy efficiency. So those are the reasons that I got from AI, but I'm going to add something that I learned from experience that AI didn't have. I had an electronic device that was misbehaving, a big one, an expensive one, and it was misbehaving for two days. 
And even the experts who had done this installation hundreds of times <laughs> could not figure it out. And after a phone call, the level one engineer, after 40 minutes on the phone on the second day, it's just like the Bible, okay? It went on and on. That first level engineer said, I don't know. I'm going to have to elevate you to the second level engineer. <laughs> and we got to the second level engineer. And the second level engineer said, you need to power cycle the unit for five minutes. And the technician said, how long? And the second level engineer said, five minutes. <laughs> A full and complete five minutes. And <laughs> guess what? Voila. That's what did it. So interestingly, that just power cycling the device, everything else was done absolutely right. Everything we tried, everything we did six times over from Sunday, we did everything correct. We did nothing wrong. It just needed a brainwashing. But the brainwashing, here's the takeaway. Sometimes a quick rinse is not enough. <laughs> Sometimes you need a full brainwash. And five minutes was the magic number. And it took a second level engineer. Jack, you listen to me? Yeah. The okay. big bucks. The guy gets the big okay. bucks. Okay. All, gal, all those little it you know, right. pathways in the integrated circuits and the high level chips <laughs> and the memory and the blood needed enough yeah. time to drain the gunk. That's a technical term. So it needed a much longer <laughs> nap than we thought. So Ariel, when you're having electronic problems and if somebody goes, if you've tried everything, try the power cycle, but don't rush it. There you go. Wow, that is some story. I usually just unplug and plug back in and a lot of times that works. Most of the time you could do it quickly, but what Stan is saying in his solar system, which I assume this is what it's about, in this particular case, it had to be off for five minutes. And I, the engineer was explicit because the technician said, <laughs> well, I've done that. I power cycled it no. really five minutes. And the engineer said in a very soft tone, oh. very engineer like, no emotion, <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we listened and we did That's it and we funny. timed it. And lo and behold, it worked. Yes, that was it. the problem. There you go. Something simple. Yes, yeah, something simple, but something that it often is. Uh, but something that you wouldn't necessarily stumble into on your own. Right. You know, so I'm- Why I, don't the instructions tell you to do that? He wasn't reading the instructions because he's done a hundred of, <laughs> you know, he's done you hundred of these, Ellen, right, have you Stan? ever met a man? <laughs> read the instructions. Men don't read instructions. <laughs> That's true. We're, we're pretty stubborn creatures, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> so anyway- well, that so is hysterical. The, so I, that came from real life, and I thought, Ariel, that would really help you out. There you go. All right. Kristen from Parts Unknown writes, This is not my real name, and I really don't want to say where I'm from. I am a lighting designer who works at an outdoor summer festival in the South. We have had thunderstorms on most days this summer, and when we try to clear the stage, the production director overrules us and tells us to keep the system up and finish the rehearsals. As this is a right-to-work state, there are no unions on site. I complained to the production director, and he told me that maybe I should look for another job. What should I do? Wow. Look for hmm, another job. <laughs> yes, so I would definitely. Do. <laughs> First, can I can I hear that question one more time? Oh, you want me to say the whole question again? This is a long question, Stan. It is. So what Kristen is saying is that she's a lighting designer. She works for a uh, outdoor fi festival, the summer outdoor yeah. festival. They have thunderstorms every day, just about. Right. Um, and uh, what, when the thunderstorms happen, she tries to clear the stage, turn the system off, you know, get people to safety because where there's thunder, there's lightning, as we know. Right. And right. the production manager steps in and says, no, you can't do that. You want to keep the rehearsal going. She complained about it, and she was told basically to find another job. Is this in Florida? She didn't say. She just says, I, this is my real name. I don't really want to see where I'm from, but it's from the South. It's a right-to-work state, but there's a lot of right-to-work states in the Well, we uh, are a right-to-work state, and this happens here a lot. I'm not a lawyer, but um, uh, that production manager is taking a huge yeah. liability risk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I, I belong to this Facebook group. It's called Keyboard Players and Cover Bands, and this guy posted a video of his band literally playing in a thunderstorm. 
They were, they, I couldn't believe it though. There was no covering on the stage. Rain is pouring on him. He's got like this tarp over his keyboard and his hands are underneath the tarp and he's playing and he's saying, hey, this is cool, man. Isn't this funny? And everybody said, are you out of your mind? I mean, the guitar players were out there. The rain was pouring into their guitars, into their amps, and they weren't happy. You could tell they weren't happy. And it's like, no, this is stupid. You do not mix electricity and water. Right, I mean, come exactly. On. Do they have electrocution ex- in- insurance? Are you talking about the this the summer theater festival? Yeah. I don't know how you could protect yourself for that right. because it's a negligence case. It's negligence. It's no negligence. You know, and, exactly. and I guess there's, okay, I, I looked into this a, a, a couple of years ago. There's two levels of negligence. So there's ne- negligence level number one is you made a mistake, right? And negligence level number two is called gross negligence. And gross negligence has to do with this meaning that a negative outcome was foreseeable. So in this case, the highly negative outcome is foreseeable. So it's so you're really flirting with fire there. I mean, I, I uh, but this lighting designer is not the is not the decision maker, right? It's right. the production manager. Right. right. So she should just go protect herself and and sort of people get are another on their job. Own. Get another yeah. job. Well you know this the scary thing is not only could the equipment totally malfunction and be useless afterwards if true, it's true, burned true. out or right. explodes or something, but right. what about they send the cute little high school kid, hey, Jack, go turn that back on. <laughs> Jack's yeah. smarter than that. You know? Jack would not do that. Jack's Jack, would you do engineer. that? Yeah, if someone said there right. was a thunderstorm and turn on that no, big but later, master no, switch. But a, no, so, not <laughs> during, but after, you know, but it got wet and who knows? So, I don't think Jack okay, let me, let me think put Jack so on the spot for a minute. Okay, yeah. Jack knows better, but he somebody else might not. Better. Yeah, but I'm going to put Jack on the spot, <laughs> Jack. What is the path of least resistance? Uh, the ground, like anything to the ground. Right. So when you've got copper and you've got equipment, the lightning wants to get through the path of least resistance. So the wires and the cables that are all plugged into grounds help the light. So if you're anywhere near that path of least resistance, that flash, that bolt is going to be right next. So, yeah, I mean... It is, it's really full of heart. I live in a place in the country that is the highest lightning strike incident place in <laughs> the world. That's true. That's Between true. Orlando Florida. and Gainesville. Most is the people high die between. on golf courses in Florida from That's lightning right. strikes. In fact, we were outdoors the other day and it was rolling in. And Pam and I like to sit on the patio when it's raining. Mm-hmm. And this bolt came and it was a flash, like we were inside a flash bulb. Mm-hmm. And we turn off our computers, we unplug stuff from the wall when we're having strikes. And now the weather apps show you where the strikes are. Mm-hmm. That's right. Right. So it's it's sort of, a, uh, uh, yeah, she needs to just um, protect herself. What happens, doesn't she said to him, well, what happens if the equipment blows up or there's a terrible accident? No, it sounds like this guy doesn't even respect the people who are working for him. So why would you imagine that she would even have a chance to say it? It sounds to me like this guy's a jerk. He basically said, if you don't like it, you can leave. Yeah, I, you know, well. I'm rethinking my answer. I don't know if I would leave right away. I would go, first of all, to OSHA and report them to OSHA. You need to report this person, okay? And then you quit. Right, right, right. You know, unfortunately, that the, in OSHA, the federal level OSHA, can be superseded by state level OSHA, and and a lot of and the state I live in has its own state level OSHA office, and they do have to be in alignment with federal, but they can be less restrictive. But I just think that that's it's just you know, it's it's moral hazard. Mm-hmm. It's a moral hazard. She's putting people's life in danger. Light, lightning storms are not to be taken yeah. lightly. Well, she's not. This production director is. No, it's the production manager. Yeah, right. the production manager. And did they have the authority then in her situation? I wonder if that person has the authority to make people stay in position or stay on stage because that's, you know, isn't the equity, isn't it, if it was an equity company. Oh, of course. Ellen, so that's a union. They, they're, they're no Yeah, equity the equity on, yeah. steward would, make, would say, everybody get off the stage, right? A few episodes ago, I was talking about Central City about three years ago during COVID when we did outdoor shows. And our steward, it was an IATSE crew, you know, all... Agma, all equity. The IATSE steward was there with that app you're talking about, Stan. And if lightning was detected within 10 miles, we'd shut everything down. 
clear the stage. Everybody would go into a building. Oh, you're in the mountains of Colorado. Yeah. That's, no, that's nothing no. to screw around with. Exactly. Right. So uh, we weren't going to screw around with that at all. Uh, but yeah, I would I would leave there and I would definitely report them to a safety organization, whatever that local safety organization is. And for the listeners out there, here's a little stand tip, pro tip. <laughs> the two most vulnerable wires in your house are your cable, your coax, and your telephone line if you have old copper lines because they're not grounded. And that's path of least resistance. Right. Those are the wires that will get, that the wire will go. Because if it's going to my computer, there's resistance on the line. But on the phone line and the coax, there's no resistance. It's just the modem. That's why your modem goes first. It's the first place down the coax line. Depends on how you're doing it. Fiber probably doesn't transmit lightning. It's not copper. It's glass. So I don't know how that would work. But I just learned that the hard way. And they're hard to ground, Right. And here I thought my landline was good in case of emergencies. Ugh. Well, yeah, except for I would, I would try smoke signals. <laughs> right. <laughs> You'd probably be better off. Right. Smoke All signals, right. I like that. Yeah. You are listening to Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers and Sister. And today's Light Talk is sponsored by... Light Talk University. Are you discouraged that after studying theater for years spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on student loans and realizing that after all of this, you are soon going to be replaced by artificial intelligence software that allows the director to create the lighting design in seconds. In addition to all that, you are now witnessing the theater profession dissolving because of high production costs, reduced donations, and lower attendance. Soon there'll be no places left to design lights. Yes, that is downright depressing. Well, maybe it's time for you to give it up and do what your parents always told you to do. Get a real job. A job that artificial intelligence cannot replace. A job like being a plumber, a carpenter, a steel worker, a short order cook, a sanitation worker, or maybe even a podcast host. Because everyone knows that these are the only jobs that will survive the AI revolution. You ask, David, where can I learn such dynamic below average paying trades? Well, there's only one place, and that is Light Talk University. That's right. Light Talk University will teach you secure trades that will keep you out of the food lines populated with the likes of Stan, Steve, Ellen, Zach, and David. And for those who think that you could always teach, well, let me tell you a secret. Those washed-out, tenured academics are holding on to their cushy jobs like an alligator clamping down on a river rat. But you say, I was born to design lights. It's in my blood. Well, Light Talk University is known for its uncanny ability to deprogram lighting artists from their pathetic artistic souls. You will soon realize that there is no need to create when you see the real human toll left behind by artificial intelligence. And Light Talk University is proud to be accredited by no one. That's right. It has proven that all these accreditation organizations are corrupt, with its highest rankings going to the highest bidder. You see, we roll differently at Light Talk University. Instead of bribing these bogus magazines, the administrators of Light Talk University prefer to spend its money on research trips for our staff, like cruises to the garbage barges floating in the fjords of Norway, or research trips to the far ends of the globe to study cuisine preparation. You know, every now and then we even splurge on a new plunger and carpenter toolkit. So stop paying those endless student loans. Leave that crappy graduate program before the bank repossesses your cat. Prepare yourself for surviving the new AI revolution with an education from Light Talk University. You will thank us in the end. Where do I sign up for this? <laughs> You're a faculty member on it. What are you talking oh, about? <laughs> I think this is great. What a business model. Because, That's you know, there's always going to need some guy with a wrench. After, Absolutely. after the last two weeks, let me tell you, the guy with the <laughs> wrench and the screwdriver is the guy you need. I love it. Is is that the one that put the water in your walls? No, that you know that 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 kind of stuff. You know that what? Happens. If you were up in a hundred and forty five degree attic with a with a headlamp on your forehead, that's an easy thing to happen. And actually, most of my plumbing is in the slab. One pipe that feeds the refrigerator happens to be in the attic. Mm. There you go. Interesting. Yeah. Next to electrical conduit, probably. Right. That's what my right. brother just found out. He just bought a house. He bought a million dollar house, and now and now he has no water pressure. And they looked at me. They, they discovered that they when they replumbed the house, they used really thin pipe for water, run right next to all the electrical conduit. Who the hell inspected this? <laughs>
And now, back to the ridiculousness of light talk. (laughs) Well, the sound of those rabid monkeys chasing those ducks in heat means that once again it's time for Let's Talk About. And today's Let's Talk About is all about Artificial Intelligence and Education. Will universities survive the future? Well, we talk about AI a lot on the show <laughs> because it's so disruptive, <laughs> as Dan says. So everybody has an opinion. It's not only us. You know, I was watching Morning Joe this morning, and there was this guy on there. He was an AI expert, and he had some interesting thoughts about education. But, you know, actually, all this came from an article that was released today from Academ Today. GPT-4 can already pass freshman year at Harvard. It was written by Maya Bodnick. And Maya, if I mispronounced your name, I apologize. Maya is a student at Harvard. And she decided to go ahead and test to see if professors could recognize essays written by ChatGPT and what grade they would give them. So she would hand in these essays to these certain professors. She was right out front. She says, look, I'm just doing an experiment. These aren't legitimate, uh, but I'm not going to tell you which ones are written by humans and which ones are written by ChatGPT. So she did, and three of them got A's, and uh, two got B's, and the the sixth one got a pass from a pass-fail. And in every single instance, they were written by ChatGPT. And not humans. As a matter of fact, she didn't hand in any humans. She did only handed in the chat GPT ones. So that is pretty uh, disturbing <laughs> when you think about it. There are two quotes I would like to read right now from this article, because this is why I've removed all writing assessments from my classes until they actually can figure out how to detect chat GPT. Let me give you a quote. I've discovered that Neil, my roommate, has been using an advanced AI system to complete his assignments, something far more sophisticated than the plagiarism detection software can currently uncover. To me, it feels like a betrayal, not just of the university's code of academic honesty, but of the unspoken contract between us, of our shared sweat and tears, of the respect for the struggle that is inherent in learning. I've always admired his genius, but now it feels tainted a mirage of artificially inflated success that belies the real spirit of intellectual curiosity and academic rigor. I think this sentence should be sent to every single professor and every single administrator in a university, because as far as my university is concerned, there's no policy about this. There's no policy about AI and cheating using programs like ChatGPT. And then she uh, summarizes everything by saying, this puts us on a path to a complete commodification of the liberal arts education. Right now, GPT-4 enables students to pass college classes, and eventually it will help them excel without learning, developing critical thinking skills, or working hard at anything. The tool risks intellectually impoverishing the next generation of Americans. Professors need to completely upend how they teach the humanities and social sciences if they want to avoid this outcome. And I just want to kick this off to Jack, because Jack is in school right now. And I don't want to put you on the spot, Jack. So I'm going to just ask a general question. Have you incorporated AI at all in your studies? Um, yeah, So I definitely have used ChatGPT, not on essays, but more of like researching new things and trying to get a concept of like things I don't understand, which I think it's really good at. Um, My school personally has implemented a policy probably the same week that ChatGPT really started picking up steam where it's not allowed on any English assignments. But other than that, there hasn't been anything else. So, I mean, I, I... totally agree with that um sentence you read that i thought was really great um whereas like it, it kind of feels like people are being betrayed because these students are using it and it's bypassing the whole academic rigor that most people are feeling through this assignment and it's and one of the reasons why i removed all the uh, essays from this one class is because it's not fair to the students mm-hmm. it's not fair to the students who 
do feel it's important for that rigor and who decide to actually take the time to critically analyze what's going on and put it down in writing. That's what critical thinking is all about. Yeah. Instead of someone who punches in the prompt and like 20 seconds later, a 500 word essay comes out of it and they hand that in. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting because like while the English department put out a statement, they haven't changed their curriculum or anything. So it's still the same where we have whatever five essays a year on the books we read and we just have to get those in. And I don't know what their detection part, like it how does, that works. Detection doesn't work. It does yeah. not work at, at this point. That was in the article as well. The detection is, is weak. It doesn't work. And if there's evidence of it, it's not evidence. It just says it feels like this could be, could be written by JetGPT. Yeah. You can't approach a student and say, I'm giving you a zero for this, or you got to rewrite it. And because that student could say, prove it. Prove that I, I plagiarized. And you can't. Unless you ask ChatGPT the same question and get the same answer. It's original every single time. You can ask ChatGPT the exact same uh, input, and it will give you a totally original uh, document. I think one solution, solution um, it, to this is like, instead of asking them, or instead of asking like an AI, did you write this? You could ask the student, hey, can you explain your answer? or elaborate on this. And the students who took the time to analyze the work and um, write the essay will know what their paper says, whereas others won't. So maybe incorporating more like Socratic seminars mm -hmm. into classes versus just straight up papers right. um, is a better way to do it. Yeah, and that is what this, this author said. But you see, if a lot of these classes have 60, 100 students in there. Right. It's really hard do to do that, you know. Right. Uh, but that is exactly what the students su suggested for smaller classes and what I'm doing for my small classes. So, Stan, how do you feel about this? What I do want to share is I was in my doctor's office getting my physical. And there was a poster on the wall that said, would you be interested in participating in a, in a study uh, uh, using artificial intelligence. And I said to the doctor, what's that? He goes, yes, yeah, are you interested? He goes, so I look at it. I took a picture of it and I signed up because UF, we're a research university. It happens all the time. And it was through UF Health. And the deal was you got online at the appointed time. It gave you a series of ailments of how you were feeling, a cough, or you were having this or that. And you would describe to the chat what your health situation was and then it would come back with more questions and so on and you would have this interaction and you don't get to know whether or not you're speaking to a physician or an artificial intelligence computer and I'll be curious to see what the output is because I think what they're trying to do I'm now I'm going to speculate for a moment is there's a shortage of of healthcare professionals in the country and there are things that if you talk to the doctors they're stressed out and they can't give you the attention that they need to, particularly on a serious case or a difficult situation. So if a simple routine thing can be done that way, that and it frees up the, the human doctor to do the things you wouldn't want a computer to do, that could be a good. And just to top it all off, they gave me a $25 Amazon gift card, and that was very nice. <laughs> no wonder. <laughs> well, there you go. That pays for your Wait, chat GPT. You don't want the robot to do your open heart surgery? Well, oh, well we have that here. We, they, have, they do yeah, cancer yeah. that way uh, with incredible precision uh, with, ro with robotics and lasers. It was in, one of those devices was invented And spinal here. surgery. Right. But I wanted to say, you know, greed is real. So, you know, I'm investing in AI. <laughs> There you go. I don't think it's going to be a fad. I think it's going to be no, around. No, this is definitely not a fad. Here's another point of view. I just asked ChatGBT how AI is changing the world. And it gave me a list of areas in which it's changing things. Under education, it says, AI-powered educational tools can provide personalized learning experiences, adapting to individual students' strengths and weaknesses. This technology enhances the learning process and makes education more accessible. That's correct, Ellen. 
This morning on Morning Joe, Rafi Krikorian, who is one of these AI gurus, and he has this very popular podcast, the guy's really super smart, was, they were asking him, so what are the benefits you know, of chat? Because everybody's talking about the negatives. He says, well, to Stan's point, they're using it in cancer detection, and it's more accurate in cancer detection than a, a human being. So that is pretty amazing, just that one little thing. But he also mentioned what Ellen brought up, and that is that students will now be able to create their own curriculum, actually specify what subjects they would want to learn and who will be teaching them. But even better, the program will learn what learning challenges this particular student has and will tailor the delivery method and the content to that student's needs. Now, that is very, very exciting. So that means like if somebody wanted to come to my school and I do a lot of opera design, but they really want to do television design, then instead of finding a school that will, you know, that first of all, they can go in debt for, they could just go into chat GPT or whatever, whatever the program is going to be called and create their own curriculum and have you know, Bob Bonyol teach them. Dennis Size. Dennis or uh, Jeff Ravitz, all these amazing video people. And why not? I would rather do that than, you know, no offense, Stan, than spend three years in Gainesville in one place. And I think this is the future. And this is not just happening in the arts. It could happen in everything in education. Could be. I want to ask Jack a question, though. If that's the way of the future and you say at home, and it's online, and you can get any expert you want from around the world to teach you exactly what you want. What happens to your social life? That's right. Good point. I think, yeah, um, like school is the place to meet friends, I feel like, at least mm -hmm. for me. I know it can be different, um, uh, but like, yeah, I don't have a great answer for that. I think that school is really important, but I, I just wanted to expand on what you were guys, what you guys are saying. Um, I feel like another big part of school that's not being accounted for for AI is like these tools are already available to learn things you want to learn about. I think a big part of the reason that schools exist is because you need someone to keep pushing you in order to learn new things. I mean, I don't I think if you have a drive to learn something, you absolutely can without school. But to get like a well-rounded education in things that you're not interested in, you need someone like a teacher pushing you to keep going. That's a good point. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we all had teachers in college who, and high school who inspired us and really helped us, you know, mentors, people who helped us shape our futures. Okay. One, I want to, oh, let me stick on Jack's point about mentorship or about someone to push you. I have a little list of um, quotes from Ted Lasso, which I'm in love with. <laughs> and I'm watching it. Love Ted Lasso. Okay. <laughs> Great but program. Here, but here's one. And I don't know if AI can do this yet. I can't be your mentor without occasionally being your tour mentor. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, but you can't say that. <laughs> I'm going to say to every student, every one of my new, my first year grads is going to get that on the first day. Because yeah, and I think they're going to freak somebody out and they're going to report you. Okay. Now, the other thing David mentioned about the healthcare and the cancer detection, what they can't see, what the biologists, the genetic biologists cannot see is when your DNA replicates, the proteins fold on top of each other. And this is where the mutations that cause genetic diseases happen. And they cannot visualize it because they don't have the 3D capability to do that. So they mm. can input all the, all the um, uh, uh, I don't know what they're called, antigens or whatever they are, all the sort of chemistries that, that affect protein folding. And now they can see that, what's been hidden. In the, gen in the genetic code when cells replicate. And that is going to be a huge boon for humanity's longevity because think about genetic diseases and genetic mutations. And as we age, the telerods, which are the long pieces that actually deteriorate as we age, which they know that contributes to aging. I don't know. Now, here's a quick speculation. If we have these, this huge boom in healthcare and longevity, we're really going to start to have to populate other planets. <laughs> and oh, change that's social for another security. day. Let's that's not, for another day. Let's not have that conversation <laughs> yeah. today. Well, there are aliens. They finally came out and said, yeah, they're aliens. Yes, there are aliens. They know <laughs> well, that. Well, thank you, Stan. That was really great, man. And thank you, Jack, for that. Uh, Ellen has the last question of the day. 
Well, there you go. Maybe Jack can help us answer this one. April from Chicago wants to know the best way to successfully integrate follow spots into her lighting design. And I will be the first to say that I understand why people use follow spots, but I hate when you go to the opera and someone has designed an absolutely positively magnificent, mysterious Rigoletto. And all of a sudden there's a giant white circle in the middle of the stage. I don't like it. So That's how do you get away follow from spot that? Up. Okay. Right. Well, so April wants to know how to successfully do it. Subtlety. Subtlety. Okay. I mean, I've done okay. operas all my life and, uh, and I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, man. And, and I don't do, that's not how I do follow spots. And nowadays, and I've talked about this on the show before, not only do I use like a frost, you know, or some type of diffusion to make a soft edge, but I will have them from wider angles so I can get more of a shape. And now that you have LED, you can color tune that follow spot from Q to Q to Q to Q. So it mixes in better. All right. Most of the time, I don't use follow spots in operas. I just don't. I don't use follow spots. I'm able to light them, and the directors are coming from theatrical backgrounds. They don't want to see follow spots. But whenever you get someone who says, you know, I think we need a follow spot, I will do it so subtly you'll never notice. And if I always tell my operators, if I notice it, then you're too bright. There used to be stars that had it in their contract, though. Yeah, right. Well, those days are over. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> Jack, what, are you about? what about follow spots? What do you think? Um, uh, I, this is one of the questions where I would be learning from not talking, but I'll, I'll try to give my best answer. Um, I, I think I, I agree with what Ellen said, um, but incorporating it to where it's not noticeable, um, man, I don't know. We've had this big, bright circle spotlight at my school for the longest time. And that's all we've used. So, but this year we're getting some source for follow spots. Mm -hmm. So we'll finally get to experiment with those and I'll get to see what it looks like a little more subtly and a little more tasteful. You know, there's some new ones from Robert Juliet, for example, that are tunable uh, color and they're, they're beautiful, really, yeah, really beautiful. Yeah, but they're beautiful. expensive. So, they're, those well, Robert Juliet's but... are the best follow spots made, in my opinion. Right, they're I like wonderful. them a lot too. Yeah, they're awesome. Stan? Lights. Well... I, I can't argue with what's been said. What's been said is correct subtlety, and it can be done. It, I'll just play old guy and historian for a moment. Um, my high school, Sheepshead Bay High School, back in 1974, when I was the captain of the audiovisual score, but I didn't have a pocket protector. <laughs> <laughs> Nerd! No, I, was pretty ge- I was pretty geeky. <laughs> were? You were but geeky? Here's, the, here's some history. How, everybody, everybody remembers the great sinographer Joel Melzina. Right. Uh And Joel Melzina asked Kliegel in the 1950s, I believe, or 60s, to design him a follow spot that would be so subtle that he could use it in a play to just delicately bring up the prime character without it being noticeable, as David so beautifully expressed. And they created a light called the Dynabeam. And we had a Dynabeam. It was a 3,000-watt incandescent mogul bipost lamp, went in from the top with asbestos leads. And the front of it, okay, and the front of it had a Fresnel lens. And it was soft. It had no hard edge. And you had a dimmer. So you could do exactly what David is describing. You, so that has been a holy grail for follow spots. And I would say that technology now absolutely exists. I think it's a, if, if it's ugly and noticeable and and garish it's because somebody it's human right that's david he's done it and he's been doing it i've done it you can do that and it can be beautifully operated and sometimes you just want a little bit of sparkle in the diva perhaps but it doesn't have to be this burlesque flat thing it can be quite beautiful and so to give her the technique diffusion filters running a barrel color mixing to the complexion or you know it it can be done so I think it just takes attention and artistry. I agree with everything that's been said. Well, there you go. So we'll go attention, subtlety. Artistry. Artist, yeah, diffusion artistry. and artistry. Right. Yeah. I like the old Fresnel lenses. Why don't why doesn't somebody bring those well, back? Well, you can those do that. You because because we don't need them don't because need you have them. diffusion. Right. There's other ways to do it. I know, yeah. but they're so lovely. Anyway, well, we'll tell April to, to think Ellen. about. Um, I know, but. 
There was a- be subtle. Be subtle. Be subtle. There, <laughs> there you, you go. go. <laughs> well, we're at the end of the show, and uh, we would love to thank Jack for being with us today. Jack, you are awesome, man. Thank Got you. Thank you, you guys. Stepped up, came on the show. Let's get more people. Jack, tell your friends. Right. I think after year 10, Jack is going to be one of the um, guest uh, hosts on Light Sure, Talk. why not? I mean, after six years, we're tired of our voices. We need yours. That's right. Right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're now way into our seventh year, Jack. Yeah. We need a new generation, man. Come on in, buddy. Come on in, everybody. <laughs> Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tell us that once again you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. Not a single guarantee, not even a little one, is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions that Jack or any of us made. However... <laughs> However, if you do decide to litigate the Snooch Group with the legal team of Sparks, Burnout, and Chase, will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Right Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sister coming to you from Rancho Santa Margarita in Gainesville, Long Beach, and St. Barts. And be sure to join us next week when we talk more about lighting shenanigans and serve you more of our casserole of nonsense. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor all around the world. Brilliant, Jack. For seven years. Yes. <laughs> we will see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye. Bye.